Hello and welcome to Future Squared. Stephen Hawking once said that intelligence is the ability to adapt to change, so let's adapt. My name is Steve Glaveski, and each week I'll bring you conversations with preeminent thought leaders from a variety of fields to help you think in a multidisciplinary way, kick goals in your professional and personal life, and better navigate what is fast becoming a brave new world. Future Squared is brought to you by Collective Campus, an innovation accelerator that works with organizations to unlock their people's latent potential to create more impact for humanity and lead more fulfilling lives. If you need help driving your organization's innovation strategy, visit collectivecampus.io. And without further ado, come with me if you want to live. In other words, my why in flying is not me. It's not stroking my ego. I am a servant to the passengers to keep them safe. And so if there's no ego, then any effort that any team may or makes to improve the quality improves the safety of the passengers. Welcome back to Future Squared for episode number 281 with Richard Decrepney. Melbourne-born and educated, Richard got his first taste of a future flying career as a 14-year-old when his father took him on a tour of the Royal Australian Air Force Academy at Point Cook in Victoria. In 1975, at the age of 17, he joined the Royal Australian Air Force. One year later, he started flying. During his 11 years flying transport jet and helicopter aircraft with the RAAF, he was seconded as Ald de Comp to two Australian Governor Generals. Richard then remained with the RAAF until 1986 when he joined Qantas flying Boeing 747, Airbus A330 and A380 jet aircrafts. In 2010, he was the captain on board Qantas Flight QF32 when it suffered a catastrophic explosion. His multi-award winning and best-selling book QF32 is a blow-by-blow story of what went right when things went wrong in the air. Richard still flies the Airbus A380, delivers presentations on the elements of resilience to governments, agencies, and Fortune 500 companies. In 2016, Richard was made a member of the Order of Australia for his significant service to the aviation industry, both nationally and internationally, particularly to flight safety and to the community. This was a deeply insightful two-hour-long deep dive conversation with Richard on a number of topics that pertain to not only surviving a crisis situation in the air, which fortunately few of us will have to do, but how to apply the elements of resilience to better navigate crisis in our own lives, embrace adversity, and thrive, whether in a business setting or even when it comes to our own interpersonal relationships. As you'll discover, Decrepney thinks critically about a wide range of disciplines that each serve to aid his understanding of the world and his decision-making characteristics that were key to the safe landing of the aircraft. Amongst the plethora of topics we discussed, expect to learn 1. Why you need to first understand your mind if you want to master it. 2. What the eight elements of resilience are and how to use them to your advantage. And three, how to understand risk and make better decisions, particularly in crisis situations when our threat-detecting amygdala is often prone to hijacking the more rational part of our brain and wire us to react instead of respond. Expect to learn this and a whole bunch more in my far-reaching conversation with the one and only Richard Decrypny. Welcome to the show, Richard. Thanks, Steve. Great to be on it. No, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. And um, you're no doubt, I imagine, quite busy at the moment, seeing as your new book, Fly, Life Lessons from the Cockpit of QF32, just came out. So congratulations. Thank you. It's a six-week uh, PR tour, and it's a blur. It's a blur of interviews. But I do enjoy it, and I'm really going to be, going to enjoy your talk because our interests, the, the whys of, of, of how we do things and, and what comes out, we are totally aligned. So mm. I'm going to really enjoy this, this interview. Oh, 
I, I imagine I'm probably going to enjoy it more than you. So let's see who can enjoy the conversation more. <laughs> <laughs> um, so obviously a six-week book tour. Um, I imagine it's mostly a virtual book tour, a lot of podcasts, or are you doing anything in person, any sort of uh... – oh, no, I'm doing lots of tours to bookshops. I'm doing lots of uh, TV programs. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, it's really going across the all the communications channels. And actually this is the first Skype one. But uh, all the communication channels, and then I hope to tour um, America and start all over again. Yeah, and we were just having a conversation before we went live about exponential technology and the impact it's having on people's lives that people often take for granted because we usually base our worldview on the last 20, 30, say 40 years. Um, but you look at this conversation, for example, we're having this conversation through Skype with relatively cheap infrastructure. Um, well, in terms of our microphones and our headsets and whatnot, but anybody anywhere in the world with an internet connection will be able to listen to us have this conversation. Whereas you think back 15 years or so, it just wouldn't, wouldn't have been, um, well, such technology wasn't democratized. To do the same thing, you need to spend a hell of a lot of money and work with a studio just to get the stories out, whereas now we can get the stories out to people in every corner of the globe, which I think is an awesome time to be alive. It's so true. And one of the chapters in my book uh, called Fly is is on knowledge. It's the elements of resilience. So so one of the elements is knowledge. And in the initial draft, it went to 200,000 words. I was discussing that the church really had control over knowledge and they disseminated what they what they wanted. They they and books were handwritten. And then the printing press was probably as great a revolution as the internet is for us today. And then knowledge is getting out. And then the internet has has changed everything. Google. I I remember in the seventies, I was working with a friend who was in America, and he was trying to build a relevance engine to build a search engine, and he was having trouble. But Google did that. And so Google has unleashed everything really ever written onto the internet for anyone to find. And so even though there are pressures from people to to oppress free speech, anyone can now have a conversation, put it onto Facebook or social media and have it spread worldwide. So there really is a freedom to get your view out there and people do. And so the increase in knowledge, the exponential growth of knowledge upon knowledge that is retained in hard disks, um, it's it's a world that is growing exponentially and it will continue so. So it's going to be, you know, I think this is the best time to be alive, the best opportunities. There's a great quote that when the winds of ill blow, some people build walls, other people build windmills, and I'm building windmills for all the disruptors that are ahead of us, which is energy, storage, sentience and silicon, mm. automation, genes, graphene, which is extra materials, um, 3D printing, and currencies, so that the disruptions, sorry, and robots, ro- robots that that will end up probably sleeping with. They'll be they'll be friends. Thirty percent of people sleep with their pets, mm-hmm. and but the elderly are very lonely, and so there'll be the first use for sentient robots. I think will be to provide companionship to the elderly, so they don't get lonely, because in their personal resilience having a relationship with someone, talking to someone, keeping their friends is vitally important. And um, so all these things are opportunities and it's going to be a wonderful future and this is the best time to be alive. So you've obviously got quite a passion for technology, but not just for technology, but more so what it can do for humanity, uh, Rich. And where, where did this come from? I mean, when did you first start getting enamored by technology and what it can do for people? I think the first, the person who really got me going is when I was probably six or eight years old. It was Julius Sumner Miller. Now, do you remember him? Were you too young? I I think I may have been too young. I I do read about a lot of people who are alive two millennia before I was born, but I have not come across him. So please enlighten me. I think Julius was a Canadian, a mad sort of, he scratched all his hair off his head. He was half bald, um, a slightly aggressive professor who was in, in Australia. And he did programs on TV called Why Is It So? And he would get students up on the stage and he would berate them if they didn't know something. But he would give the lessons and really good practical demonstrations of physics and why things happen. And it was fantastic. He wrote a book called Milligrams. And so, which was only a hundred pages with about 50 questions. And in the, in the seventies, I wrote a book called uh, physics for the coffee table, which was another to carry on for milligrams. 
and uh, I haven't published it yet. I, that's that's a fourth book I have to do. But the um, so he, he Sumner Miller got me interested in physics, and then the motorbikes and everything else. I, I've always been interested. I was interested in the Carno, so the sort of engineering was there, and it just kept going. But I'm in the more IT side of engineering than the nuts and bolts. And with respect to flight, uh, did you take any inspiration from stories of, of, of guys like Charles Lindbergh um, and, and the Ortega Prize, or was this something that you kind of came across once you had already joined the Air Force? Because you joined the Air Force when you were just 17. Yeah, uh, the, the Air Force um, went on a bivouac. This is before I joined it, and they got lost, and they ended up on my father's property and damaged it. So as compensation, my father said, you must take my son on a tour of the Air Force. Huh. So we went to the academy at Point Cook, and there was um, supersonic wind tunnels. There was um, space observatories. There was flow tanks. There was all this highest tech stuff. And they were doing research there as well. So all this highest tech stuff I've ever seen. And I've been riding motorbikes and I could fix them and maintain them and mm -hmm. ride them. But the Air Force uh, gave was really like motorbikes, but with an extra dimension and, and 10 times the speed. So the Air Force then got my interest. It got my passion going. And so I joined the Air Force and I was after everything that was high, highest tech and fast. So I, I always wanted to go to the F-111, uh, which was the fastest aircraft and most highest tech. Mm -hmm. And I did for 20 minutes, but that's another story. Okay. And, um, but, and then I joined Qantas and I wanted to go to the biggest and the best technology. And that's I've worked my way up through jumbos and now I'm on the A380. So, uh, yes, I've always been chasing the biggest and the best. It's just – and it comes with a risk that I've always been the first to get onto the newest aircraft. And many pilots, perhaps 80% of pilots, don't want to get on the latest aircraft. They're, they're a bit nervous that it's something that hasn't been properly resolved because aircraft always have changes when they come out. Maybe there'll be an incident. The majority, and also pay hasn't been resolved. So the majority of pilots avoid new machinery and I actively go for it. And so I have, I have jumped hundreds, hundreds of, of, of levels in seniority because I've been prepared to take the risk. With the risk comes a chance that things go wrong and you make a mistake and your life changes for the worst. But there's also an opportunity um, that things might go well. And, and QF32 was probably an example where things went wrong. It wasn't it was Rolls-Royce fault, but it was an accident. I, I'm not angry at Rolls-Royce. Everyone makes mistakes. You know, humans, pilots, we don't stop things happening. We can't because we don't know how the engine was made, how it was serviced. We don't know the mental state of the passengers that get on board mm -hmm. that might cause a diversion. So pilots don't stop things happening. We just, we recover. We're resilient. When things go wrong, we try and, and, and stop it or fix it or mitigate it. So, um, Everything to do with high tech to me is resilience. You take a risk in getting into it and you have to work your way out. And so flying is just one part of resilience for me. And um, the rest of the IT is, is, is the other. I still run a computer company um, with my wife. It's been running for 35 years mm -hmm. and it's successful. And when I complete flying at the age of 65, I will go into uh, sentient robots. Fantastic. How old are you now, Richard? 61. So I've got four years to go. I'm, I'm, I'm setting up it. We, well, I'm waiting on parallel computers. We really, the human mind is a parallel, massively parallel computers, 100 billion neurons, 100 trillion synapses or connections. And in terms of knowledge, the knowledge index of the human brain, in other words, well, um, if you have a thought in your mind, it connects to about a thousand, on average, about a thousand other things. So when you think of Richard de Crepney, you've got a thought of a pilot, a thought of a man, a thought of someone in Sydney. That's three connections. Well, the human mind generally has about a thousand connections for any bit of data. Mm. And the data, I have a knowledge base. I've been tracking, I've had a knowledge base my whole career. I, I don't use paper, but my knowledge index is about three. So the brain's a thousand, I'm three. So until we, and for most people, their knowledge index is almost zero because they don't correlate stuff. So, or they keep it on paper. So um, 
th th there's a long way way to go, and um, um, but that's 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 why we're not ready for sentient robots yet because we haven't got the parallel processing. But once we do, things will happen very quickly, mm. and it will be a, a fantastic and brave new world. Yeah, and I, Elon Musk mentioned something on the recent interview that set the internet ablaze, literally and figuratively, the um, interview with Joe Rogan, where he started talking about Neuralink, which is their um, human-machine brain interface, um, and he believes that they'll have something to – uh, announce in the next few months, which will be an order of magnitude better than anything else that exists in this space. And, and when you say that, you know, the human brain has 100 billion synapses and connections, you can imagine the, the gravity or the level of difficulty associated with something like that. In fact, some people are saying getting a human brain interface to work effectively is harder than, say, sending rockets to Mars, um, in some cases, and maybe Musk's most, um, ambitious. Um, oh, I, I think it's 100 billion neurons and 100 trillion synapses. 100 trillion um, synapses. Ab about. It's about that, you know, yeah. plus or minus 15%. Yeah. But the, um, I think it's much harder to, to tap into the brain from outside than it would be to go to Mars. And, and also the brain is plastic. So people think that the, the, the conventional view is that one part of the brain does one thing. But no, if you – some people are born without a cerebellum, but they can still walk. Mm -hmm. And people have are born – some people have had the hippocampus taken out, but they can still function. So the brain, brain is plastic and you can't just say, well, I'm going to target this one area and expect to get something useful out, maybe on, on an average person. But um, and also your brain, every person's brain is different. As you get married, one, one of the most wonderful things is the longer you're married, the more your brain with your wife synchronizes and you start to build up the same neural network. And so one, one sense will trigger the same response. It even goes so far as in muscles on the app, we have 650 skeletal muscles and one thought will trigger those muscles to take up a, a posture, which we call body language. But um, your dog ends up having the same body language as, as, as its owner. Mm. And so um, everything is unique and I, I'm very dubious that someone says that they can understand what, where, the, the thought. I can understand that there's an activity in the visual cortex or the hippocampus, but ex then explaining what we're thinking is um, a lot more of an interactive challenge. Yeah, and just to circle back to something uh, you said earlier, Rich, around you've been the type of pilot who has always embraced you know, the new, always gone for the biggest and the best, even though it represents uh, potential failure, potential risks, it's uncharted territory. But as human beings, you know, we're wired to shy away from ambiguity, from uh, novelty, because we're not sure what we're going to get. We're afraid of that risk. And ob obviously, we're wired to that because of um, biological evolution. And when we we're running around the African savannah tens of thousands of years ago, that made sense. But in today's environment, particularly for say, managers and leaders out there in, 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 in the business world, technology on the outside of these organizations is moving much faster than these organizations themselves. So in order for them to survive and thrive, they need to get better at um, adopting uh, the unfamiliar and getting better at navigating ambiguity. So in your particular circumstance, you've always embraced it. So where do you think that comes from? Okay, first of all, um, there have been lots of discussions about linking IQ to success. And I think in probably, if, if it's an intelligence-based thing you're doing in management, IQ probably has a great correlation to success. But if you look at people like Microsoft, Amazon, um, SpaceX with Elon Musk, all these people, that they don't have the highest IQs at all. Um, in, in fact, in the Air Force, the Ducks of the Air Force Academy was a poison chalice because they generally killed themselves. And the Ducks of my year killed him. He was the first to die in an accident. So sometimes to have these local successes builds up um, too much ego and they, they get complacent. But for the people who are truly successful in, in the highest, these high risk ventures, um, which I'm talking Microsoft and Google. These are all young people. Most of the Nobel Prize winners were in their 20s. And these people had, well, success is, is passion um, plus execution plus discipline. So all these people had, and particularly Musk, he certainly had the passion his whole life. 
and his passion for leading edge high tech is probably similar to mine, but he executes it much better than I ever would. And But he also has discipline to stay in there when the going gets hard, when he fails, he stands up and he tries again. He learns, adjusts and retries. So there's, there's great discipline. And so in the high tech world, the people who are succeeding and innovating are the younger ones. And um, generally speaking, in terms of success and as we go forward, Charles Darwin in talking about evolution, he didn't say that the fittest survive. He says that those who adapt survive. So we must, we will adapt or we will perish. Equilibrium is a precursor to death. If you don't change, you're dying. If if DNA doesn't change, the species, species perishes. But with change comes risk, risk that you have to embark on something else. In IT, it means you're standing on the, or you're surfing the edge of chaos. You, you're an innovators and early adopters. And with that comes the risk that if you will often fail, but when you win, when you succeed, the rewards can be great and you you have great success. Um, so again, when we fail, the, the successful people are unafraid of failure. They see failure as stepping tone, stones to success. And that's what Richard Branson um, talks about really well. And Elon Musk, they've, mm-hmm. all successful business people will say they've failed on their way to success. If you've never failed in anything, you've never made a decision. So it's important that we learn to fail well, which means we accept the failure, we pick up, we learn, adjust, and we retry. And my son was having trouble at university in, a, at a, in engineering, and he said, I failed maths and I'm going to give up engineering. I said, no, you know, it's not... The important thing about failure is not that you didn't pass, it's how you respond to failure because you're going to fail many times in your life. Mm -hmm. So pick yourself up and go and do it again. There's no damage done. And uh, and he then went on and he's been incredibly successful. So these are all the attributes of surviving in high tech. But there's there's one other thing I want to talk about. Mm -hmm. And this didn't unfortunately make the book. Uh, if I if you just took I took the ratios of neurons and synapses and and modified and in volume in the brain, and I took these different equations and uh, of the ratios and differences, and I discovered that when you're young, because the the neurons grow quick more quickly than the synapse connections. So young people have all this data, but they have no context to put it in. They haven't got the synapses to link it together. They've got all the information. They think they know everything, but they have no wisdom to put into context. Mm-hmm. So they're frustrated. They're they're uh, reckless. But guess what? They're also creative, and this is why the young people who have all this facts but no way to correlate it. They think up their own correlations. They, they, they create their own new internet or, or Google or Microsoft or electric cars. So the young people are creating. Creativity dies by the age of 35. After 35, creativity wise, you're gone. Now, people find that offensive for me to say, and they say, no, I'm 50 and I'm still creative. No, you're not. In my book, I give a, a, a quick test to show uh, your experience bias. In other words, experience does bias the brain. All our knowledge is put into our brain in context with the existing knowledge. And so we don't actually store, when we see something, we don't in our brain store the dots that we see from our eyes, but we store representations that it's a line or it's a character or a number or it's a car. So as you get older, more experienced, everything becomes biased and there are illusions. And so what we can do in old age is use our experience to be creative and experiment with our experience. So we can take known information and develop truly wonderful things, uh, um, cures for diseases, but we are too old to create something totally new. We've lost it. So if you want, again, it's a long way to get to this answer, but if you want to be a successful company, you need to employ the young, creative, innovative people with the older, experienced, wise people. And that's a big lesson from my book. You need both to thrive and survive. Yeah, yeah, and that aligns perfectly with uh, what um, a past guest of mine by the name of Larry Keeley, who is a, a huge name in the corporate innovation world, says of organizations trying to be innovative, they need to really empower their younger people coming up with the opportunity to experiment, to take risks, to to 
adopt emerging technologies and just try different things. Um, because ultimately, if you put them into a box and just tell them that, hey, here's your job description, just do what's on here and nothing else, you will ultimately stifle them. And they will either grow disgruntled or leave and join a more progressive organization elsewhere. Um, and it's just interesting, even from a neurological perspective, I know that the um, our prefrontal cortex isn't completely online until we are about 25 years old. And up until that time, because of that, we tend to take more risks and tend to embrace more ambiguity, which also aligns with what you've said there about people in their 20s um, winning Nobel Prize prizes because they do take those risks and they are wired to take those risks. Whereas the older you get, even though you may think you're creative, I can see what you're saying there because we tend to see the world through both the seeing eye and the perceiving eye. And this is something that uh, Mayamoto Musashi, the author, Japanese swordsman from five centuries ago, he was the author of the Book of Five Rings. And he said, we have the seeing eye, but our how we choose to, our, our reality is effectively about our perceiving eye and how we perceive things. And after a certain point, you tend to color the way you see things based on your experience of life up until that point. Well, that's right. And and the brain has three million, about three million sensors coming in, two million from the eyes and a million from the rest of the nerves. And that would overload any brain. So the brain chunks information down and it also narrowly focuses. It's like imagine imagine an emergency response room with a thousand screens all showing different things. You can't absorb it. You would autistic people see those thousand screens and it overloads them. Um which is a symptom of autism, but the um, what a what a what a good human brain does is to focus down on the things that are important. And so, and if there's a hole in that information, it will fill it with an illusion. And um, but but so we only see a small view into our world. We miss other things that the brain decides to keep away from us. Which brings up there's a thing called the invisible gorilla mm. experiment where a gorilla walks on the stage but no one sees it. Um, so again. All our knowledge is can only be stored in the context of what we already have. And so the young people that have no contexts are the best to find the new patterns and the older people can't. When I gave this experience bias test to a, to, to a doctor, to a professor who's helping me with the medical part of the book, he he was so he became so angry because he couldn't solve the problem, and if he he had twenty minutes and he couldn't solve it, and uh, a, a person two or three years years old would solve it immediately. So it's a great ex, ex, it's a great example of the experience bias mm. and how humans change and how it's really it, it's a great example of how the human mind even works because if we needed the processes to to manage three million inputs and to drive the 650 skeletal muscles and have a total awareness of everything, then we'd need megawatts of power. We'd need a brain the size of the room. And so the brain has decided to have a narrow focus, build up a situation awareness model. It has a body model to, to, to think about what arms and legs it has. And the body model can sometimes go wrong. And you have a phantom limb or an alien limb. Um, sometimes people wake up in hospital and they don't discover their legs gone until they see that it's not there. In other words, your body model is, is a stored representation of your body, which may not even be right. So it's, it's all the brain, how the brain works is fascinating. You can look at the brain from a chemical, a biological or a logical basis. I look at the brain simply from a logical basis. And in my mind, I can understand it. It makes sense to me. And that's why I'm looking forward to sentient robots because I can understand how they're going to work. Yeah. And, and I guess given that, Rich, when it comes to making decisions, I mean, if you are, say, 45 years old, you can only rely on your intuition to so much. Um, and I guess that's why something that I've talked about on this show as well previously is you can use intuition up to a point, but then you should also use data, but then you should also use other people's intuition and people who aren't likely like you. So in the case of say innovation, getting people together who are say 25, who have the ability to think um, laterally to embrace ambiguity, getting people together into that group who are say 45 and have the wisdom and the experience, but then also using some data to round that out um, and perhaps make better decisions than you could by 
relying on your intuition alone because your intuition is shaped by your experiences and maybe you don't have the breadth of experiences and the depth of experiences that will help you make the best decision in any given point. I, I think it's worthwhile separ- just being clear about this. Intuition is is really stored, learned decisions. So if you're a fireman and you've uh, been to 100 fires, you've had to analyse very carefully, maybe slowly, all the conditions that might determine how you fight the fire, whether you go into the room or not, whether you leave the person to die in the building, unfortunately, or whether you can get them. So these might be long made decisions, but you can store them away and then recall them quickly. So intuition is 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 a gut feeling or, 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 a, or a habit mm-hmm. that's recalled quickly in a complex situation. But intuition is not a gut. So intuition is not always gut feelings. Gut feelings are things from, well, in fact, your gut has a million neurons in it. Your gut is actually, some people refer to it as an extra brain. But it's giving you, with proprioception and all these different senses, you have certainly more than five senses, but they're all feeding into your brain at a level of, that is below speech. In other words, if these senses are feeding below the level, sometimes of your consciousness or, or sp- certainly speech, you say, I have this feeling, but I can't explain it. I don't know why. I don't like this person. Now, that's probably um, your body decomposing the body language postures into a, an understanding of what the person's like. But but you might have this gut feeling that I don't like this person or this I feel this. Mm. Now, if the gut If you have a gut feeling about something that you have experience in, like if your gut feeling is about going into a building in a fire and you're a fireman, you can trust that gut feeling. But if your gut feeling is about something which you have no knowledge about, then be very careful because it's probably full of illusions and biases that will make that wrong. And and, and the good example is is most people think the world's getting a dangerous place. But the reality is quite different. It's Stephen Pinkler in his book Enlightenment Now mm-hmm. and um, Hans Ros- Rosling in his book called Factfulness yep. show that all the data about humanity is actually getting better and it's different to what we think. So people's gut feelings, and, and Hans brings this out at the start of his book Factfulness with 15 questions, and most people don't get more than five right. The more intelligent you are, generally the less questions you get right because we have we have this gut feeling that the world is like this, but it's the total opposite. And so, again, in, intuition or intuition is, is great. That's learned learned decisions. The gut feelings, you only follow your gut feelings if it's in your area of competence. Yeah, and I, I've read both of those books. And um, I think one of the questions pertains to what percentage of people in, what percentage of children in Africa do you think are vaccinated? I think was one of the questions. And most people thought that it was maybe something like 20%, when in fact, I believe it was up above the 90%. It was 80, 80% of children at one year of age has had at least one vaccination. Yeah. Everyone should read that book because this is in support of my windmills theory. The world has never been better. If you ever, cho- most, if you ever had to choose when to be alive, you'd want to be born today. Mm-hmm. And, and, and this, I suppose, you know, we've been talking about the fact that today access to information, access to knowledge is abundant. At the same time, the brain can only process so much of this information and there's a hell of a lot of noise out there. And so I, I guess a big part of the reason why people think that the world or, or people may have a very, a very negative sort of view of where the world is going. And you hear people mutter uh, you know, absolutes like, oh, the world's terrible. We're all going to hell. This is, we're living in the worst time ever. And obviously they've not really done the research, but a lot of that is colored by the news and, and the news tends to report negative information. In fact, something like eight news stories to one tend to be negative um, versus positive. And people tend to then color their view of the world based on that, have a negative outlook, a negative predisposition towards things, and then their behavior is subsequently affected by that. So how important is it for people to be more deliberate around what kind of content and information they actually consume, Rich? Well, that, that, that's a big topic. First of all, now I'm going out on a limb here because I don't know that anyone necessarily feels the same way I do. My brain is full. My 100 billion neurons hundred percent occupied and I I would like to learn other languages I like to learn the piano mm-hmm. but I know that if I do I'm going to replace neurons or data in one neuron with something else the neurons have a neural growth factor it's 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 a chemical that determines how many connections there can be to a neuron how many synapse connections there can be you've only got so much so when you when you start to connect the neuron to other things 
you lose a connection somewhere else. You can only attain new knowledge at the expense of old knowledge. Now, that's not so bad because we should get rid of legacy data mm-hmm. and and make have constructive destruction. We should get rid of the old information to make way for the new. Um, so I, I think in terms of knowledge management um, and and this is corporate systems as well. We have to be prepared to, to drop old knowledge and actively seek out the new. Um, so that was the first thing I wanted to say. But the second thing was in relation to news. And it was many, it was decades ago, there was a concept of fear, doubt and uncertainty. And, and that was Microsoft because it would all, it would release Windows 3 and then a very shortly after would say, okay, Windows 4 is now, you know, be a year away. And it would create fear, doubt, and uncertainty to keep people on their toes and make them want to get ready for the next next version and want them to go into it. Mm-hmm. And they had many software companies have a one-year up, up um, uh, renewal policy or yeah. updates just because people expect that they need the latest change. Now, the media creates fear, doubt, and uncertainty, and plenty of American politicians got into power because they said the world's a terrible place. We have to drain the swamp. Everyone else is a threat and don't trust anything. Don't trust anyone. And that is, that's in, that's flying in the face. And that's totally opposite to what Stephen Pinkler and Hans Rosling saying that the world's never been better, cleaner, safer. And so rather than people getting scared by the news and the news will in news in Sydney in the morning, we'll publish all the deaths from the night before and all the research into deaths the, in the past few years. If they can't find anything, if there were no deaths the night before, they'll go into a police log and find that there were two drunk people arrested. In other words, the news is always negative and it's counterproductive. So I don't, I don't read many newspapers anymore. Um, I read the Financial Review, but I get most of my news now off Twitter. And so I can pick the journalists in the world that I respect and I get news feeds from these journalists around the world. So I, I'm, I'm cutting out a lot of the negative news that serves zero per- purpose. In fact, the negative news just makes people scared mm-hmm. and or fear, doubt, uncertainty. They're scared, they're afraid to do things and they think the world's going bad, but we have to yell out that the world is going in the right direction and we should be courageous. Yeah, and I think it was uh, Zig Ziglar, uh, the famous motivational coach, uh, who basically said that you are who you are based on what goes into your mind and you can change who you are based on changing what goes into your mind. So being really deliberate about the books you read, the the news you watch, the people you associate with um, can go a long way to shaping how you show up in the world. And, and there's one thing, I'll, I'll, sorry to interrupt you, but it's the brain works by associating. It's, it's, it's again, the knowledge index, yep. which is my term is a thousand. So there's one neuron, neuron connects by a thousand synapses. So one bit of data has correlations to a thousand bits. Mm-hmm. And so I, all the time while I've stored my knowledge uh, in aviation, I store it in a computer in a knowledge management system. And at, I've, I, I have about 15,000 topics and about 60,000 hyperlinks. So that's why my knowledge index is only three or four compared to um, 1,000 for the brain. But most people's knowledge index is less than one. Mm. And um, so, but it's important if you are worried about your brain being full, and, and, and I am conscious that my brain is full, anything that I use to augment my mind in terms of extra knowledge by reading a book or whatever, I'm, I'm storing it using the same techniques that the brain stores knowledge in the neurons. Right. So, so I guess just on that point, Richard, I mean, I know a lot of people who are very curious about the world. They tend to, you know, gloat about reading, say, a book a week and listening to a couple of podcasts a day, usually on double speed, going out to a number of conferences, uh, associating with a lot of uh, curious people and, and learning from them as well. I mean, are they effectively doing themselves a disservice or does it really depend on where they are in terms of their capacity to learn new things? I mean, is there a risk that they're lo- losing a lot of that old knowledge? I'm not really com- competent to give, to, to, to say what other people are. Yeah. Like there are people with what we call photographic memories. They remember everything they seem to read. And so mm. that, that comes at a cost. That has always come at a cost. 
And the more the photographic memory, the more dysfunctional or more functions they lose um, to be. Remember, the brain could be overloaded. So it has the brain has to narrow focus on things and not see everything. You know, we do not want to be like Sherlock Holmes and see everything in the room because we would we would have to be um, autistic and and we lose the, the ability to function to our maximum uh, possible degree. So we must ignore much information. We focus. You see, you, you don't feel your toe now until I'm mentioning it. Now you can feel your toe. Mm -hmm. You don't feel yourself breathing. So the brain, the brain actively um, inhibits many senses. So you can keep a focus on what's important. That might be this conversation. Mm -hmm. So um, we, as to how much, if people read too many books, I read a whole lot of books, a book a day. Unless they're doing something to lock it into their brain, they're going to lose it. Yeah. Part of the book um, describes the when you the, the concept is use it or lose it, and that applies to your mental process and your physical neurons and muscles effectively melt if not or dissolve if they're not being used. So if you want to store some knowledge, you read it once, then you revisit it in 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 a, in a few hours or the day. If I have to remember a checklist, I will study that checklist once a day, and when I get the checklist perfect, then I'll revisit it once a week. And then when I get that checklist and the pet checklist stays perfect in my mind, then I can revisit it once a month. But you have to keep revisiting. You've got to use it to keep it alive. So if you're reading a book and you're not documenting it, and if you're not reviewing it occasionally, 99% of that book will disappear from your memory. Mm. Yeah, one, one thing I always try to do with any book I read is to uh, type out my highlights and then also turn those highlights into, say, a blog post or teach someone else what I've learned or try and apply it in some way. Otherwise, I will forget 99% of what I've read within three months unless I go to, to that extent. One thing, one thing that, that – and this didn't make the book. One thing that intimidates people that I sometimes work with is that – when I read a book, I read it through once and I'm underlying things that are critical. I'll highlight sections. My book is trashed when I finish it for the first pass. Then I go back and I go through everything that's underlined and I integrate it into my knowledge management system and hyperlink it to other sections. And so when I've done that, my book then becomes part of my extended brain, which is my knowledge management system on the computer. So I have cross-indexed aviation. Everything I've done in aviation I've stored on the computer and it's massively cross-referenced. So you know, things can link in all directions, but it means that I can find, if I can't think of it in my brain, I can cross-reference it uh, in something which is working similar in my brain. And I need to, I need to be uh, clear here. This is not like doing Google. This is not like having a Microsoft Word document or doing a search. Your knowledge management system in a computer must mimic the same structure of the knowledge that's in your brain. It's personal and it's different for each person. But my knowledge management system mimics the way I'm, my brain works. And so I can find information very fast. I can find the information with the source or reference immediately. Mm -hmm. And that intimidates some people. Yeah, and I, I can see that coming across in this conversation as well in the way you're um, effortlessly recalling quotes and and, and facts and statistics um, Quite seamlessly. Um, I think it's definitely worth something that uh, our audience should ex explore further and something I'll, I'll definitely look into. But, but there is a cost. I don't read fiction. I don't have time. And it's not that I don't like fiction. It's just that I don't have the time. And, and honestly, I, I, while I'm a professional, I have to reserve my precious 100 billion neurons. Mm for my industry. Yep. Makes sense. Makes sense. And before we get into QF32, I mean, we've obviously gone off on quite a few tangents already, 43 minutes into this conversation. Having said that, I am enjoying uh, the nature of the conversation. Um, earlier, we were talking about uh, negativity. And I think one comment you made was that it serves no purpose. But in fact, I think it serves a, 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 a uh, detrimental purpose. For example, if we look at uh, terrorism and the media's inclination to support to report on terrorism. Um, if you look at the total number of deaths globally because of terrorism, it's something like 25,000 and about 
plus percent of that is in the Middle East. Um, if you look at incidents in the USA, it's something like 25 deaths a year. Uh, Europe is something like 50 to 100. Um, yet, yeah. Um, but I guess when it comes to terrorism, the overreaction to terrorism based on the media and, and the public outrage that it um, creates poses a far greater threat to our security. It's kind of like the, um, the, the, the story of the bull in the china shop. Um, if, I'm a, if I'm a fly in a china shop, you know, I can't break anything. I can't even uh, knock over a little mug. But if I get into a bull's ear and start buzzing and t- you know, make the bull go crazy, then the whole china shop will be destroyed in, in a moment. So I feel like negative media uh, reporting, uh, negative sentiment can force public policy, which is ultimately detrimental and helps, um, say, terrorist groups achieve their outcome because on their own, they can't do it. It's our overreaction to certain things that poses that threat. So I guess it's just critical that people maintain a positive outlook and be really careful about where they're getting their news from it and make sure that it's not just some media outlet looking to get eyeballs and clicks so that they can sell ads. Well, I think the purpose of terrorism is to create terror in the mind of of the recipient. And the terrorists achieve that very simply um, because they've got the help of politicians and the media. Politicians Mm. use terror to help them help the public think that this politicians is a solution mm-hmm. to these non-existent problems or the perceived problem. And, and so these politicians who spread doom and gloom get voted in. Um, the media, people, media has tried in the past to report good things, but it's been found that people don't buy newspapers if it's only got a good information. And, and let's face it, most of the TV article, TV shows we see are about investigators or stories of people investigating other people's deaths. Mm. We seem to have this pathological um, secret passion for death. And, and I don't quite get it. I, I actually don't like all those detective stories. Um, I don't need it. But the but the terrorism feeds off of our basic fear system, fear circuit. And the fear circuit has the amygdala, which is part of the old brain. It's so, so all the old, you know, it's, it's hundreds of millions of years old. And so a rabbit or a horse, it has a good amygdala where it recognises the, the characteristics of a threat. Mm-hmm. So a noise, a, a thunderclap will make a dog, make a horse and a, and a rabbit run away. And you really can't stop that because yep. they don't have a big enough cortex to regulate and inhibit that startled reflex quickly enough. We will still jump at the sound of, 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 a, of a starting gun or something that's unexpected uh, because that's our amygdala firing off saying danger. But even though we jump and we might move a couple of centimetres, the, the amygdala works faster than the cortex. So the cortex says, hey, takes half a second to say, hey, look, I've seen this, I know what to do, just relax, and it's all right. You know, the amygdala acts in, in within 100 milliseconds, and the cortex takes half a second. So we're moving according to that startle factor, but, but we quickly stop. And so fear of flying is, is not a logical fear that it lives in the cortex because last year 50 people died and 4 billion people travel. So that's really safe, 50 people. So aviation worldwide is, it would be safer, certainly safer than terrorism. It's, aviation is one of the safest industries in the world. Um, but people have a fear of flying, and that's because their amygdala is firing off these things like, I don't know what's happening, I can't see, we don't have control, the wings are going to break off in turbulence, uh, the there's no, there's no pilots in the cockpit. It's all run by computers. And, and I know it's not logical, and they know it's not logical, but they can't stop it. They can't even necessarily express it because the amygdala is below the level of speech. And so the fear of flight is something that they often can't explain, but it's real. And so I have been successful in, in, in 80% of cases, I can solve people's fear of flying. And I've written about that in Fly. And I, and I explained to them, and these, these are business CEOs. These are people who, who don't want to fly or can't fly, but they're in a business and they have to fly. So these people don't want a fear of flying, but they can't stop it. But I can, I've been able to cure it in, in, in 80% of cases. And I, I say, look, I know that you're, you're intelligent. You understand the facts that flying safe. But that's not the problem. The problem is your amygdala. It's the emotional part of your brain. And we have to 
look at that and understand that you're pumping your senses and then stop your pumping your senses and you can take control. And and when you would do it this way, it makes sense. I do it on an airplane, hoping, hoping the airplane will bounce around and people will learn to detect their amygdala firing and then learn how to override it. And, um, and there's a spectacular success story that's in fly of a, of a woman called Irma Sullivan who had a fear of flying and it was her last flight and she would told her family that she would not see them again because she was going back to England and she was too scared to go flying. And this last sector, we went into London about two years ago and it was a St. Jude storm that was forecast and the airline in the UAE, all the airlines in the UAE had stopped their flights to Europe because of this storm and I was to take Irma to London and Irma said, why are we flying if every other airline has grounded their flights to London? and oh, it's the UK. And I said, we'll be okay. So it was a challenge at the start of the flight. I fixed, I cured her fear of flying and she's been flying ever since. So again, all these fears, fears of terrorism, fears of anything, they're emotional, they're not logical, and we can cure them if we, if we attack the right source, which is the emotional center. Mm-hmm. And just one last thing, 9-11, in 9-11 about 3,000 people died, but it created a massive fear of flying by CEOs and movie stars. Now, CEOs and movie – Concorde was on its its first flight after rebuilding the aircraft after crash in France. Concorde was across the Atlantic when 9-11 hit, and it landed, and everyone generated a fear of flying because of 9-11. No one jumped on the Concorde. So Concorde program failed because of fear of flight and 9-11. But all these people stopped flying and so many more people got onto the roads that the increased number in road deaths in that first year exceeded the number of people who died in 9-11. Yeah. Well, I think in the USA, something like 50,000 people, uh, there's about 50,000 fatalities a year on the roads. Um, And what did you say, about 50? It's about 30,000 on the roads. And and, and I know that it's about 30, 35. And the reason I know that is because it's equal to the gun deaths. I think gun deaths might be more than road deaths now. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I mean, uh, the the amygdala is something that we've discussed on the show before, and obviously, it, you know, it, it, the, the amygdala becomes aware of negative uh, influences or threats several times faster than we become conscious of it, and it's something that Daniel Kahneman talks about in his book uh, Thinking Fast and Slow on the notion of systems one and systems two thinking, and systems one being uh, your gut rea- well your gut reaction to things. Uh, so is- you must have sat in my book fairly comfortably because I I mimic a lot of uh, I use a lot of Kahneman's thoughts. Uh, yes, yes, definitely, and I think. People oftentimes are held hostage by that systems one thinking. And ultimately what I find is just taking some time and space to not make that gut reaction. And speaking of which, I mean, we're 51 minutes in and we haven't really touched all that much on fly yet. But back in 2010, for our listeners who may not be familiar with the story, um, while you were piloting a Qantas A380 above Batam Island in Indonesia, one of the engines exploded. And ultimately, a lot of the experienced crash investigators later revealed that recovery in such circumstances is almost impossible. But in this particular instance, you were able to, and you and the crew were able to keep your cool and land the plane successfully. So what do you think, I mean, how did you effectively make sure that you responded with reason in that space rather than react because it would be easy for a lot of people to um, to just operate under certain conditions quite comfortably. But once they face adversity, once you've got this life or death situation, they can just throw out the playbook and just make gut reactions and jump to conclusions and make bad decisions. So I'm keen to unpack um, how you were able to respond in a very measured way. All right. Pilots are trained, perhaps like military, special forces, firemen. Pilots are in the simulators four times a year. Mm-hmm. We get taken to hell and back for four hours. We practice things that are beyond our comfort zone. We come out sweating. We're challenged and we learn heaps. We, we sometimes have to repeat things because we don't, we don't do well enough. 
but we come out and we keep our skill set not just up to one level, but we're continually advancing. It, it's We're doing deliberate practice and we're getting better with time. A lot of people, for instance, say um, in the medical industry, people will, will be become surgeons and be, be granted the right to operate by the College of Surgeons. But then there's really no auditing of the, of the of the doctor and proving and making sure that they go into simulators that they that they that they must improve and and they're actively recertified. In other words, if they don't pass that test, they cease to be able to um, practice. And I'm not zooming in on on doctors. There's almost no profession. Legal profession has has no requirement. Uh, see, for a board director, there's no requirement to be on a board to stay on a board. So. Um, but pilots, are, we have seven checks a year where our license is either renewed or continued or it's taken away. So when I get in an aircraft and I look at my co-pilot, I know he's gone through the checks that I've gone through. I know how hard they were for me and I know that he deserves to sit there. So competence is for the job is never an issue in an aircraft cockpit. Um, that's point number one. Point number two is, and I have to digress slightly, um, after QF32, I was fortunate that I travelled the world and I was talking about QF32 and why it was a and what happened and, and why it was a success. And so I was talking about the elements of resilience for pilots. But with each person, each group I talked to, which was doctors, mining industry, legal, governments, all in every profession you can imagine, I would do a SWOT analysis first. So that's strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. I analyze the audience I'm talking to, and then I render my QF32 information into their speak. And then I, because of that, I, I was discovered I was in a luxurious position of looking at the best practices of all these other industries as to what made them resilient, what they had, what they were missing. And so I, in a way, it was a bit like Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Successful People. I suddenly came about to discover the attributes of, or the elements of resilience, personal and corporate resilience for all these people around the world. And that's given me now the platform to make a generic book about the elements of resilience that I'm calling FLY, which lets people personally and in a community and, and professionally in their companies not just survive the crises, but but fly, but 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 excel. And there are eight elements of resilience: knowledge, training, experience, teamwork, leadership, crisis management, decision making, risk. Now I'm including post-traumatic stress because everyone will suffer that, and depending on how they recover, that will determine their resilience. And the last thing is that all of these um, subjects sit on the foundation and are connected to the foundation, which is neuroscience. So if you can understand how the brain works, then we understand why we need to do things to remember. Remember, I've dis discussed knowledge management. Well, for training, what's the best way to train? Deliberate practice. I, I extend it to saying there's stress-proof deliberate practice. It's a term I've created or method. Um, experience. Experience can be a curse. Experience can absolutely be a curse for people who don't engage in a lifetime of continual learning and they, they don't have construct, constructive destruction of old legacy information. So we can go through all those things, decision making and risk, and these make up the eight elements of resilience. Um, and when you do get all these things together, one of the personality attributes that you get is a thing called chronic unease. And chronic unease is, it's a bit like doing a pre-mortem. You, you work out, before you do something, you get together and you say, look, the system failed. We, we, we failed. Why did we fail? And when you go to a meeting and saying we have failed, you then give everyone who has negative thoughts the opportunity or you're giving them encouragement to speak up why it's failed. In other words, when you have negative, when you have chronic unease, you're, you're getting all the bad things um, you're inviting everyone to say what is bad that you can counter and plan against before the thing happens um, because p sometimes people are a bit afraid to say negative things. So chronic unease is vital for pilots because every takeoff is going to be aborted. Every landing is going to be rejected. Um, every time we fly to a destination, the weather's going to turn bad or the winds. So we, we have this great chronic unease. We're expecting the worst, hoping for the best, 
and we're absolutely expecting the unexpected. Now, that's the frame of mind. It's not, um, I guess it's cynicism and skepticism. It's not para- It's sort of a paranoia, but we're not depressed or negative. The whole time we just have this situation awareness of what's happened, what is happening, and what's about to happen, and we're encompassing all the things that can affect us that might hurt us, and we've built up a contingency in case it happens. So a pilot that says that he gets bored is not doing his job because he's not thinking of all the what-ifs. A pilot in the middle of the Pacific is actually getting worried because he's starting to get a long way from airports in case things go wrong, in case an engine fails, a critical system fails, or a passenger gets sick. So pilots keep this chronic unease, and when things do go wrong, generally they're expect you know, that. They're prepared for it in advance. When you see a lightning bolt in a thunderstorm, you can expect a thunderclap. So the thunderclap doesn't scare you. And so in the same way, when things happen, pilots are generally prepared for it. And so the feeling that we get in aviation, the feeling you want to be as a pilot, and certainly the best feeling you could ever have in life is the feeling of being bulletproof and not gun shy, feeling I'm ready. You know, if someone, if someone has, if someone's going to shoot me, I've got a bulletproof vest on, I can take it and I can survive. So bulletproof and gun and not gun shy means you're not afraid to take risks. You're afraid to get out into the open and do these things. And you're confident that if something goes wrong, you can recover. And that, and so I've mixed up all these different senses that pilots have, but ultimately pilots have this feeling of being bulletproof and not gun shy. Yep, fantastic. Um, so I think that you made quite a number of uh, really profound and important points there, particularly around experience um, and saying that experience can be, in fact, a curse rather than a blessing, particularly if that experience is quite narrow. And and I guess we see this show up in, in the corporate world now where you have someone who perhaps is a senior executive, they've been in that role for maybe 10, 15 years, and they got there based on a particular operating system that may have worked in the 20th century, but now with Moore's Law reaching fever pitch, uh, it doesn't seem to work as well as it once did. So it it can be a curse in those cases. And similarly, we see that a lot of general practitioners out there are uh, being on the, well, are on the receiving end of a lot of criticism because they haven't really kept learning um, over the last, say, 10, 15, 20 years, even though technology has continued to evolve. And, and so experience in some cases can be a curse rather than a blessing. And also on training and differentiating training from knowledge. Um, I mean, you might be able to jump onto YouTube and watch videos of, say, some Brazilian jiu-jitsu moves or something like that. But it's a totally different matter to actually be down on the mat with some 200 pound guy on top of you trying to choke you out. Uh, it's a totally different thing. And, and that also helps you build resilience when you are in those situations. So, um, and just one final point, uh, just to wrap up what, um, you, you've said there with respect to, adversity. Um, it was Jason Selk, who I spoke to a couple of weeks ago. Now he was, um, the sports psychologist at the St. Louis Cardinals and under his, well, while he was there, they won two world series titles. And one thing he said, which really stuck in my mind was that successful people aren't surprised by adversity. In fact, they, they expect it and, and they lean into it because if you lean into adversity, then you'll be far more willing to take on a lot of the challenges of life to learn, to grow, to get better than you would if you shied away from adversity because there is no growth without discomfort. Yeah, I agree. There, there was a person who said many years ago, you know, I like a good crisis and I've, I've never liked a crisis. I don't ever want a crisis, mm-hmm. but that's separate to the fact that we prepare for crises and if you are prepared, then, well, you're prepared when it happens. You don't panic. I mean, the whole key thing is when a crisis happens, you don't want to panic and do a logical things. When, 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 the, when the startle effect comes in, 15% of people will do things that helps their survival. 70% of people will do nothing and they're startled. You can be fight, flight, or, or paralysis. Now, paralysis means you sit in a seat while flames pass over the top of you and kill you. Um, or they might follow the herd away from a, of a quick exit. Um, so in, in a lot of buildings in 9-11 and also the Grenfell Fire in London, people stayed at their desks. Unfortunately, they were told to, but, but, but they followed the crowd, whereas uh, in Morgan Stanley Bank, um, 
Rick Briscola, that it's an, it's a story that's in fly. He had he had anticipated and prepared for the for an air, aircraft attack on 9/11. I mean it, it, that is true what I just said. So he had practiced his team to evacuate, and so out of 3,000 Morgan Stanley people, only about five perished. Um, and um, Rick Briscola and his and his team of, of six security people they died making sure everyone had got out. And in fact, Rick Briscola had it was a buddy team, so everyone. If two people were allocated a disabled person, and and they got them out. So all the dis- disabled people got out of the of 9/11 from Morgan Stanley. They were on the 40th floor. So um, so thinking, having chronic unease and thinking of the worst cases, and preparing for them can give wonderful results. And and Rick Briscola. I mean, 9/11 was was two days ago here in Australia, but that is one of the greatest stories um, of resilience in my mind even though Rick didn't survive. Um, in terms of experience being a curse, in my, I'm just going to read a quote. Um, I used to say experience kills. In my business, I would see people do unsafe things just because they had always done it that way, often shortcuts, and the way we found out about them was in an investigation after they died. Now, that's a quote by Anne Pickard, who was a former chairman of Shell in Australia, and she then went on to lead Shell parts of Shell in America. So if you're, if you're a surgeon and you do the same operation a thousand times and never learn anything new, that can become a curse. You get into a, to a cycle called a drift to failure where um, you, you can even get a term, I call it, it's my term, uh, am, um, automation amnesia. As you have more robots taking over, um, you start to forget how the systems work underneath. You start to lose the ability to know your systems because they're all automated. And in fact, there's a thought in medicine that most of the robots really don't add a whole lot of value, uh, but, but people insist on them. So the certainly experience is only useful if you do it in context with a lifetime of continual learning and constructive destruction of old information and stress-proof deliberate practice to get those new skills going. Yeah, couldn't agree more. And, and one of the other factors you've talked about that was fundamental in, in landing that plane successfully was teamwork. Um, and on, on teamwork, I recently read The Rebel Playbook by Deborah Corey, and she said that in order to get teams to work effectively, they need to believe in the goal, they need to believe that the goal can be achieved and they need to know where they fit in. So how does that align with the, the crew that you had on board um, QF32? Because you had, from what I understand, uh, five pilots on the plane as well as the crew? That's right. Teamwork. So teamwork's an element of resilience. I, initially, I had teamwork as part of leadership. I mm-hmm. thought that all leaders, by definition, must be good team players. And then we had an election overseas and I had to separate the topic. And... Um, so teamwork is essential, and the reason QF32 was a success is because of teamwork. And there's a in the in the in Fly I discuss the moon, um, a landing on the moon test, <clears throat> which shows every time they run it, it shows that teams will all, teams always outperform the individual. So to be a good leader means you have to be humble and vulnerable and accept you don't know everything, accept that humans make mistakes. As I said, pilots. We aim perfect perfection knowing we'll never get there. We don't stop things happening because we can't. So, um, so we expect that we will make mistakes. And I tell my crew, I will make mistakes. You must tell me. You can be, be as pedantic as you like. Just prioritise when you tell me so you don't distract me at the wrong time. And so when I do that, when I tell them that I'm going to make mistakes and please offer your support, you're inviting every person in that team to come in and to, to, to solve the problem. So what is the problem? And this is really getting to your why. Um, a friend of mine, a doctor, asked a whole lot of surgical teams, who's the most critical team member in a surgery? And people said, oh, a surgeon or anaesthetist. And he said, no, it's the patient. And hmm. in, a part, in, in the cockpit, who, you know, what is the why? What are we there for in a cockpit? My why in aviation is to get the passengers safely down on the ground to their destination. And that's everything I do is about that. In other words, my why in flying is not me. It's not stroking my ego. I am a servant to the passengers to keep them safe. And so 
if there's no ego, then any effort that any team may or makes to improve the quality improves the safety of the passengers. So again, the, when, the, when the team comes up and says, stop, Richard, I think you're making a mistake, even if I'm the leader, I take it as an, as an effort to improve safety and I welcome it. Now, I often tell the crew, stop, you know, we haven't done something or you've made a mistake. But I, by the same token, I act, actively welcome them saying stop to me to improve safety. Mm-hmm. And so it's a two-way street. And, and in QF32, the book I did discuss where I called stop and they called stop. And I, was, I wasn't insulted when the crew said, stop to me, don't climb mm-hmm. during that QF32 event. I said thank you later on because they're obviously concerned. I hadn't explained what I wanted to do. They didn't understand it anyway. And they were right to question it. And so thank you. So when you get into teams, you understand that the individual will make a mistake But the quality of the team is the ability of the team to find those mistakes and fix them. Humans can't be perfect, but teams can. Therefore, a a win is always a team win and a failure is always the leader's fault. Yeah, and uh, that's a great point as well, that a failure is always the leader's fault. And something that underpins great leadership is that whole notion of extreme ownership, like not making excuses, not blaming anyone else, not blaming external circumstances, but always... Asking what could I have done better? There's no excuses for a failure mm-hmm. it, because if if you don't if you think it's the team's fault, then you're too egotistical to realise you haven't briefed them properly or haven't yep. you haven't given them enough tools to be successful or you're you're micromanaged or you've interfered or you've you've actively done something to inhibit them. Yeah, and also what you talked about there around everybody being comfortable uh, telling the leader that their opinion on a particular decision or their opinion in general is wrong, um, which aligns with this whole notion of, say, radical candor or radical transparency, which is gaining a lot of uh, popularity in the business world today thanks to books uh, such as Principles by Ray Dalio, the the, the famous hedge fund manager. Well, yeah, I I quote Ray in the book because Ray, Ray, when someone said stop to Ray, no, that's right. They said, you know, you did a lousy interview Mm -hmm. in in the last meeting and I gave you a one out of five and Ray said, thank you. You know, I need to do need to improve. Yeah, and and that's something that people, I suppose, struggle with hearing uh, constructive criticism because rather than seeing it as an opportunity to get better, they see it as a personal attack. It's ego. It's always ego is the enemy of teamwork. You have to shed the ego, which means you have to know why you're there. If you're a politician. You're there for your constituents. If you're a pilot, you're there for passenger safety. If you're a doctor, it's for the patient and you'll do whatever you can for the patient. And and if you are on part of a team, well, if you are on a team and a decision is made that you originally didn't agree with, how important is it that despite that, that you commit to that decision 100%? I I, I will always do the most logical thing. So if the team comes up, if if there's a dispute and someone says stop, um, and, and bearing in mind that the ability to call stop depends on those circumstances. Sometimes the time is of essence and, and too critical and and you must have a leader that that makes a call and he takes responsibility or she takes responsibility for the actions. Mm. Sometimes you 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 must go or with the with the leader's decision and they're the most experienced so they should have that call. But when you do have the luxury of time to discuss stuff, it should be a, a fully analyzed decision process to work out who was correct and you should go with the right answer and the leader must be have the modesty to say do you know what i learned something today thank you yeah and and on making that decision i know you've um talked about the whole notion of risk management or risk assessment in the book where you've stressed communicating clearly you know double and triple checking calculations and never ever ever jumping to conclusions correct you never never assume or presume as i mentioned we focus in, the brain focuses on only the things it wants to focus on. But if there's a gap, you know, when you look at your eye, you don't see a big hole in the middle of your vision, even though the fovea in your eye has no um, um, optic nerves. So there is a big hole in the middle of your vision, but your brain has these, um, os- your, your eyeball oscillates and your brain fills it in. But if there is a gap in your vision, your brain will fill it in. And all the optical illusions is your brain filling a void of sensory information with a prediction. So um, now what we I've, I've, 
I'm slightly confused what we're talking about. What were, what were we getting to? Um, so we were talking about uh, risk management, um, communicating clearly and not jumping to conclusions. In- oh, yeah, don't jump to conclusions. So understand that, that there are illusions. When there's a hole, your brain will fill it with illusions and they may not be right. And people's perceptions will all be, always vary from their, their, their from where they're, they're viewing the situation. So welcome all the inputs and the truth will be somewhere in all the mix. And uh, you must welcome everyone's input. Mm-hmm. And, and you, you all, by, by the same token, you can also accept that there'll be differences of opinions sometimes. Definitely. Um, and so after all was said and done and the plane was successfully uh, grounded over at uh, Changi Airport in Singapore, um, you took the time to address uh, the passengers. So I think there was 466 uh, passengers on board the A380. Um, and you said something along the lines of when you fly Qantas, you're flying a premium airline um, and you deserve the very best. Um, and you effectively gave the passengers your number. You said, write down this number. It's my personal number. I want you to call me if you think Qantas is not looking after you and if you don't think that they care. And when the passengers were interviewed by the media afterwards as to whether or not they felt unsafe. They would say things like, no, the captain and the crew were fantastic. They kept us fully informed at all times. And in this case, it's a great example of turning what could have been potential, um, you know, never again am I flying Qantas customers to complete brand advocates. That's right. People said, why did you, why did you go and debrief the passengers? And, and I said, well, I had to. I said, well, it wasn't in your manuals. I said, no, there's no, didn't say we had to go and debrief the passengers. And does, certainly, there's certainly no discussion of how you'd do it. Um, but I told the passengers on the airplane, when you get off the airplane, you get to the terminal. When you're driven to the terminal, go to the bathroom, but do not leave the lounge because I'm going to come and talk to you. I'm going to tell you what's happened. And so this was while we're still on the ground, two hours on the ground with the emergency still going. Um, I said, when you get off, you will not go away. I'm going to talk to you. So they all stayed behind, and I then spent 45 minutes in each area giving a full and open disclosure. I told them what had happened, why, what was about to happen, and the special requirements. And I gave them a, a – there was a structure to this debrief. We call it NITS, Nature of the Emergency, the Intentions, the Time, and the Special Requirements. So there are ways you can easily remember that, you know, what to do when you're talking to people in an emergency. But um, I wanted to give them the facts – I wanted. I knew that the media, that everyone with a mobile phone in a crisis is a reporter, and in a crisis, 80% of the time in a crisis, the people in charge expected it to come, expected the crisis to happen, because about 70% of the time they caused it. So the crisis might be the bank has released private information of credit card information. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a crisis that will erupt when they tell market. And so they better be ready to explain why it's happened and what's going to happen as a consequence. So it's important that if you don't get out early and take control in that first golden, well, it used to be a golden hour to take control of the media. Now it's seconds. Um, If you don't take control of the passengers, then they will turn against you. And with the amplification of the internet, which is almost infinite, it can be, you, you can have your brand trashed more quickly than your management even knew that it happened. So I knew I was part of the crisis management follow-up and I told them what happened, why, what was about to happen to them and the requirements. And then I, I said those words that you said and I said, if you think that we don't care, and when I said, if you think we don't care, this came from, I, won't, I still remember a series of David Massey lectures back in the 80s mm-hmm. and he was talking about this term care because care is in the mind of the recipient And so I said, if you think we don't care, so all those passengers, for whatever reason, whatever they're thinking, if they if their if their perception is that we don't care, I want to know about it and I'll make them I'll show them that we do care. And I said, well, here's my mobile number. And so when you do that, you're offering vulnerability and humility. That engenders trust and teamwork. And the people thought, well, you know what? I've got his mobile phone number. If he was lying to me, I'll ring up and abuse him. Mm -hmm. If he didn't tell me something, well, I can always ring him up. But you know what? He probably thought it wasn't important, so I'm not going to stress about it. And so giving a mobile number and making, giving your personal guarantee makes people relax. It gives them confidence um, that they're getting the facts. 
to some degree they have control because they can ask me for help and it takes away all the thought of innuendo. And um, so when the passengers left the terminal and I'd given them information on Rolls Royce and Qantas, so I told them, you know, the, the engines fail, but engines fail one in every 300,000 hours. So only one in four pilots will ever get to see an aircraft accident in their lifetime. So you had probably, you in seeing this engine failure probably had protected your family from seeing one. So I, I gave them all this information. When the passengers left the terminal, the media surrounded them, throwing um, microphones in their face. They want all the bad stories, don't we? We've talked about that. You know, Qantas is a bad airline. Rolls Royce is a lousy engine manufacturer. The A380 is a hopeless aeroplane. And the passengers said, no, Qantas is a great airline. And the, the, the Rolls Royce, yes, it had an engine failure, but they don't happen very often. And the crew did everything and everyone, they were all looking after us. The whole worldwide, after that incident, the media wasn't able to I, – I still have not seen one picture of any of those passengers crying when they left the terminal. They were all happy. They were in control. This is the opposite to fear of flight, isn't it? We've inverted it. We've given them all the confidence and courage to fight, and, and their amygdala is not firing off. They were happy when they left the terminal in control, and they took charge of the brand of my airline – they protected the brand, and then the media discovered, you know what, we have no case for a negative report. We can't get one person to speak negatively of the airline, and the only story they therefore had was a positive story, and that's how they spun it. Yeah. So yeah. It, it did spin greatly, but my point is the, per, the full and open disclosure and the personal guarantee brought the passengers in as the eighth team into this event. So the passengers became part of the team. We looked after them. They looked after us. They protected the brand. And that, that's such a, such a fantastic story that, you know, you've got 466 people, life or death situation, yet not one of them had anything negative to say. Um, and that the transparency that went into it, that clear communication, this is what's happening, not just during the flight, but also after the flight and just being open and giving them some sense of control by giving them your mobile number. And the fact that no one said anything negative, I think is something that so many organizations around the world can learn from, especially in an age where if you have a negative experience, you're just going to jump onto Twitter, you're going to jump onto Instagram, onto Facebook, you're going to tell thousands and thousands of people and brands simply can't afford um, that type of negative uh, exposure. In, in the book fly, I talk about the um, United Breaks Guitars video that was on the internet. You know, it's a case of where they didn't look after the, the passengers. Um, and, and Steve, everyone says, but why did you give the personal guarantee and the full and open disclosure? Can you answer that? Why did I do it? Mm -hmm. It's because of my whys. It's because my job is to get the passengers in an emergency. My, my job is to get the passengers not just to the destination, well, not just to the airport. I'm going to get them home. And so it's a bit like that Tom, Tom Hanks movie where he's on an island with a beach ball. At the end of the movie, he delivers his parcel to the home of, of the per There was just, just, a, just a delivery satchel and he sent it home. He had to deliver that. I must deliver my passengers home in a crisis. I will care and protect for them. And so now I appreciate that's probably more responsibility than the airlines expected me to have. I will assume unlimited authority to do it. I will get my passengers home, even if I have to drive them. Um, that's my why. And when you think like that, when you know what your whys are, when you know your values and beliefs and you tell them to other people, you will attract people who believe in the same things that you believe in. And everything that you think, act and communicate is only a reflection of your, your whys, your values. So your whys are the most important thing to guide you through life. Yeah, and that, that definitely applies not only in the business world, but also in personal relationships and having values alignment. Um, if you don't have values alignment, then it's kind of like playing tug of war, whether that's with your spouse or whether that's with your employees. Um, and that's a great point. And also the fact that you did go above and beyond. Um, and like you said, you did something that perhaps Qantas didn't expect you to do is because not only the underlying why, obviously that is a very, very key factor, but also because you consider yourself not just a pilot, but an aviator. Yeah. Now, some people thought, and they actually wrote down, they said, I'm amazed that Qantas didn't um, discipline the crepney for going, going beyond his, his, response, his requirements. And, and to be frank, I, you know, I don't mind them writing it, but 
if Qantas tried to discipline me for taking care of the passengers, I would I would protect myself because I have a job. That's my job. To, my my the laws, aviation regulations say I'm responsible for the safety of the passengers, cargo, and the airframe, and and I must exercise that duty. And I will. I, you, if you give someone a responsibility, you must give them the authority. And in my case, while I'm given it the responsibility by law, I will assume the authority by law. Now, I'm in charge. They can't challenge me while I'm in charge. They have the every right to sack me later if they choose to. You know, I, I would never do anything to hurt my company, Rolls-Royce or anyone. But but my point is, you need, if you've got the responsibility, you must know your responsibilities and you must have the authority to act. The fascinating thing here and something that didn't really make the book mm-hmm was that if you ask a director of a board who they're responsible for, 90% of board directors will say they're responsible to the shareholder. And that's wrong. Mm -hmm. And that that also affects a lot of what we were talking about at the start of the conversation, which was around exploring exponential technologies, which may not deliver a return on investment today, um, will not help you grow by 5% this year, but will do so potentially in five years from now, in 10 years from now. Um, but if you're only looking if you're only guided by the interests of shareholders, then you will only invest in the short term, in the, in hitting your quarterly targets and your annual target rather than, say, your five- or ten-year target. Uh, co- correct. Let me just say one more thing just before I answer your leadership thing. The, the other critical thing about the personal guarantee that's critical is that it gives a single point of contact. And we all know cases where when we're trying to do something and we call a company – they either don't put their phone number on the website or it's impossible to contact them, or if you do contact them, they're different people and they don't coordinate. So a critical thing in an emergency, I'm the single point of contact for those 440 passengers and I will get them home. But guess what? They did all get home because no one called for help or to complain. Mm. So I ordered that personal guarantee was an audit of the whole crisis and my airline passed with just glorious colours because – Everyone was cared for, and I'm really proud. I'm proud of the team. You know, there were eight teams, and I'm proud of all those teams, and that's why the QF32 is not a decrepany thing. It's a, it's a teamwork thing. Now, getting on to leadership, um, leaders must give a, a vision of where they want to go. They should give the path to getting there, and then they should delegate and give people the skills and the and the equipment and the systems and the procedures to affect it. Leaders should make failure impossible. If the leaders do a good job, failure is impossible because everyone has been enabled to do their job. And where we see a problem with, particularly with politics, is leaders are choosing a vision that only goes to the next um, poll or election cycle at the worst, three years in advance. I sat next to the Secretary of, uh, of Infrastructure a few years ago at a dinner and I said, I think we should have a high-speed train line between Newcastle, Sydney, and Melbourne. And because what you can do then is you can build an international airport at Newcastle, and you can Newcastle will, because it's on the coast, the weather's good, there'll be less noise, runway will be open all year, and then you can build a railway line that will basically enable that whole corridor from Newcastle to Sydney to be developed. You decentralise Sydney. The NBN was designed to decentralise Australia, but it's not. we're not doing it. So build the railway and then extend it to Melbourne. And, and the, the secretary said, we don't have the money for that. Hmm. I said, well, silly, you're not meant to. You're meant to give a vision. The vision can go out 30 years, 40 years. I don't care. You just put the vision out that you're going to do it, Mm -hmm. give people the understanding of where you're going and what your values are, and then we can allocate money as the years go by. But if you give no vision, as a leader, if you don't have a vision that goes well into the future, you're in the wrong job. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I I think vision is so powerful. And I think it was about 10 or 15 years ago that Peter Diamandis uh, created the X prize to, it was a $10 million prize for the first private space flight, um, which just galvanized an entire industry. And off the back of that, we've seen the likes of SpaceX and Blue Origin. And what was that, what, what was that test in Nevada once a year where they had autonomous vehicles racing around uh, 60 mile track? And every year, the, the improvements in autonomous vehicles 
was phenomenal every year, wasn't it? Did you follow that? I, I, was, I forget the name of the uh, tests, but I definitely recall. I think they got 100. You know, the biggest – the car got one kilometre out of 60 in the first year. Next year they got 25. In the third year, third year they blitzed it at 40 miles an hour or something. Yeah. Well, there's a similar thing going on now with uh, the Hyperloop, uh, which is incidentally also something that Elon Musk uh, had a ha- – influenced the um, – the evolution of it. And that's where they have these global university competitions to see who can build the fastest capsule. And it's just, I think you, you really need to start with the vision, but then like you said, and Richard Branson talks about this as well, giving people the tools they need to succeed, um, empowering them with a worthwhile mission, which we've touched on. And in some cases getting out of the way so that they can do this stuff and not be subject to some sort of patriarchal or command and control from, from above, because that never inspires people to do their best work. They also need what Dan, uh, was it Dan Pink in his book drive says you also need to give them the opportunity for autonomy and mastery so that they can learn and also have that freedom to do things on their own and feel like they have control over what they're doing. I agree entirely with, with those, the, the people you've described. Branson is, is, is a fantastic delegator and, um, and a, and a great leader for that reason. And he's also excellent at crisis management because the CEO gets on the scene. And and Branson is, is exemplar for many things in that area. Definitely, definitely. Look, I've got just one more question and then we'll just jump into our lightning round to wrap it up, Richard. And and this was just around um, Air France Flight 447, which which was which took place about a year before QF32 back in 2009. And unfortunately, on this case, the plane went down over equatorial waters, uh, somewhere between Africa and Brazil, um, killing all 20, 228 people on board and 12 crew. Now, in this case, a lot of the, um, uh, rec- the flight recorders revealed that the pilots actually failed to uh, discuss repeated stall warnings. They hadn't received hi- high altitude training and ultimately didn't react in a swift enough manner, which I guess is complete. Is, is at odds with what you've talked about with respect to knowledge, with training, with having the teamwork, uh, making the decision, committing to it, and ultimately, in your case, having a successful outcome? It's automation amnesia. Hmm. And it's the fact that aircraft are getting I, – I did an interview yesterday where the, where the person who started the interview said, you know, aircraft fly themselves now, don't they? <laughs> and that's the perception. And um, so I said aircraft really had an automation that equates to a cruise control in your car. That's, that's about all. Without human control, the aircraft's not going to – it's not going to start itself, taxi, take off. Um, and, and it can only land itself – it can only land itself from about a thousand feet above the ground down to the. If you've got auto land, that only works from a thousand feet. So, it, you know, the automation is basic, but automation amnesia means that when you have these automated systems, now systems are getting black boxes. You don't manufacturers don't want to expose the internals in their hardware or software because well, certainly the software can be copied, and and the hardware can yeah can be reverse engineered and X-rayed and copied. So. These black boxes are sealed and you're not meant to know what happens, but they said, look, don't worry, it, it, it never fails, and this is what it, it will always do the right thing. Um, but these complex things rely on sensors coming in and being able to move things on the outside. In QF32, we had – we lost – there are 250,000 sensors on the aircraft, sensors and parameters, and we'd lost 650 wires. We probably – we lost a heap of sensors – and and we lost a lot of things that the computers could move. So the whole the whole um, basis for designing that black bot those complex black boxes was voided mm. because we lost inputs and outputs. And um, so when that happens, you really have to go back to the basics. You've got to know the systems to their core. You can't afford in an automated system to not understand the, the how the system works. When you're driving home tonight. If your car breaks down, you'll pull over. You have to be rescued and towed away. But we can't do that in aircraft. So we have to understand the system to their core. So when and, – and the other problem with complex systems is you don't know how they work internally, but you also don't know how they interface externally. So we saw that in the east coast of America when the whole power system failed about 10 years ago. Complex system pulling out, complex system pulling out, complex system – you know, it doesn't happen in our human brain, does it? No. But it does happen in our simple computers we have today. So 
the uh, autoamnesia is is part of the problem. Um, we've had p the the Air France problem was caused due to a pito heat freezing up in a, in a storm and losing their airspeed indicator. Well, Bert Hinkler, when he came from when he was trying to do a record-breaking flight from England to Australia in 1910, I think it was, he had his pito heats fail. He's froze. The Comet, which was the first pressurised jet metal aircraft that was flying in the UK in the 1950s, it was a revolutionary aeroplane, its pitot heaters regularly failed. So if we have the knowledge, if we study the past and we're aware of the past and we know the core systems and we do that research, then we can anticipate problems and we don't have automation amnesia to lose contact with what we have. Mm -hmm. And now, if so, we, if we take it, if we look at the history, we don't get all about automation amnesia. Then, then we can protect ourselves. Well, we can be resilient. The aim is when things fail to recover. If we, these are the elements of resilience that they needed, and for whatever reason, it didn't work. Mm -hmm. So there, there are many factors. Yeah. And uh, but, but again, fly all these elements of resilience that I'm talking about. It relates to the individual, the person, as well as the community and the company. They're all transferable. So interestingly, half the people, I think, fail in fail resilience because they get divorced. Now, I know there are many cases where divorce is inevitable and, and it must happen, but, but for many divorces, the people leave the partner that they were in love with and when they get divorced, it's costly psychologically, mm -hmm. mentally, financially, and they fail resilience. But why did they get divorced? And if we put as much effort, if we put the same effort we'd put into our business, into our, into our partner, um, then maybe we'll keep the marriage going and we don't divorce. You see, marriage is a bit like a formation of aircraft. Where you take off from is not where you land. And when you take formations of aircraft to stay alive because you protect each other like a team, individual aircraft gets shot, shot down. So in a marriage, when you take off, you're going to be diverting to avoid threats, attacks and risks. And so who you, Steve, who you end up to be in 20 years' time will be different to who you are today. But the challenge, remember Darwin's evolution, it's the adaptable that survive. But the challenge for you personally with resilience is that your partner changes and adapts with you that you stay in a close formation and you'll stay married and you'll stay resilient. So these elements of resilience that I've talked about many for company events totally apply to the to your to your personal life. And if we invoke those elements of the eight elements of resilience, then we will not just survive in the crises, but we will thrive in the good times. And that, that's very well said, and I absolutely love the analogy around a relationship not being about, well, where you take off in a relationship isn't exactly where you land, and that you need to be on that journey together and stay in formation. Um, and again, that comes back to the whole values alignment piece, because once you're um, not in alignment, that's when a lot of the cracks start to form. Steve, can I interrupt one last time? Mm -hmm. I just want to say one thing, which because we have, we have the time to do it. And, and pe aviation is very safe. I remember I said 50 people died last year at 4 billion. And aviation, don't take that for granted. Um, every hospitalization, every time you go to a hospital to present to have something done, your risk of being killed by an accident or an error is equivalent to being in 70,000 one hour commercial flights, right? Mm -hmm. So medicine is not as resilient as uh, aviation. But the, but what we do in aviation to be so resilient is hard work. It involves a thing called just culture, and just culture is forgiving honest mistakes and even and then classifying mistakes and learning and forgiving honest mistakes. And if we apply the just culture that we have in aviation to our personal life, then we'll be a whole lot more successful in our personal life. And I do. There is a just culture test. It's not for the faint-hearted, and and a lot of people don't like it. It's in the book. Uh, to a great degree, the publishers didn't want me to put it in, but I persisted, and the Just Culture test is in the book. And it's for those people who really want to experience just how hard it is for an airline to develop a culture that de that accepts errors, learns from them, mm. adjusts, and repeats. 
But that's what keeps aviation safe. And if we bring just culture into our personal life, well, you understand how hard it is. But if we do, absolutely, our relationships will be so much more resilient. Yeah, and I can only imagine how difficult it would be to build a culture where risks or experimentation is encouraged, particularly where, as you've said in the book, good enough is never good enough. Um, if you don't strive for perfection, then you have no place in an aircraft or in a cockpit for that matter. Um, but at the same time, it's about continuous learning and growth and, and, and moving forward. And unless you're willing to take uh, calculated risks, then you will find yourself uh, behind the pack effectively. Gene Kranz wrote a book called Failure is Not an Option. Mm -hmm. And I I interviewed Gene. It was one of the most, it was one of the best interviews I've, most enjoyable interviews I've ever done in my life. And when I, I didn't discuss it with him, but I said in in Fly that when Gene Kranz said failure is not an option, he didn't say that you can't fail. Mm -hmm. You you fail in little things so you get the big things right. And and I had to, I I sort of, I'm, I translated Gene's interview into because NASA and Gene Kranz were so phenomenally resilient, and I I've had great pleasure in looking at the lessons from NASA during those golden Apollo years, which is best one of the best years of humanity. And um, Gene Kranz came back saying that fly would be mandatory, mandatory reading for every astronaut at NASA, and it's the best book he's ever read. So um, it's. That NASA Apollo period, and, and bearing in mind that was a golden period from, well, Apollo 1 was a disaster, Apollo 11 was, was a successful landing with Neil Armstrong, Apollo 13 was the most successful failure probably in humanity, and then we get to um, Challenger in 1986 that was a failure at NASA. And so they went through this cycle, and, and I would discuss that. So even NASA couldn't keep the resilience going forever. But it's a, it's a wonderful topic. It's very deep, but I've done my best to dissect it into its elements. Yeah. And, and just, just quickly on that, obviously now we've seen uh, similar things play out with SpaceX where uh, with the Falcon rocket, I believe it was the Falcon rocket, where there was three, cons- cons- uh, three consecutive attempts to get into orbit and in all three occasions the rocket exploded and it cost Elon Musk almost his entire net wealth. But then they tried again. And with what little they had, they managed to launch for a fourth time and were successful at getting into orbit. And since then, you know, they've uh, successfully launched uh, numerous rockets and landed uh, back on Earth, both on land and at sea. And they've also managed to uh, launch a cherry red Tesla Roadster uh, into orbit as well. Uh, But they were, they needed to take the risk. They needed to endure beyond those initial setbacks. Elon Musk needed to have his ego hurt and put on the line and subject to all sorts of ridicule by the media in order to get to the point um, that they're at today. Um, And do do you think that that's something whereby we're moving away from, in the case of NASA, big public organizations using taxpayer dollars towards more private spaceflight and the fact that in today's uh, world of exponentially growing technology, cheaper technology, um, the use of first principles empowers organizations like SpaceX to achieve great things without spending um, as much money as perhaps it would take a NASA to do. Remember I said success is passion, passion execution and and, um, discipline. Mm -hmm. And Elon Musk has got all of those and he's failed along the way. And Edison, in my book I wrote that Edison said when he had 6,000 broken light bulbs that wouldn't work, he said, well, I know 6,000 ways don't work. Even for the MH370 search to find that aircraft in the Indian Ocean, we know where the aircraft is not, so we are learning something. But you've got to be careful, too, that you can flog a dead horse. When things go bad, if you have an investment that's not going well, if Elon Musk was, if Elon Musk this has 10 bad shots, at what point does he say enough's enough, we can't do it? Yeah. At what, what point, you know, do you risk, do you risk corporate or, or personal su- corporate suicide um, to chase something that maybe you can't do? And so there is a skill. Part of resilience is knowing how to analyse when to call it quits and protecting yourself. And to a great degree, that's getting into risk, that you you have one foot in a firm bed of security and, and low risk um, investments. 
and then you can take put one foot forward into high risk ventures and and experiment but all the time knowing that if it fails you you can survive so there is there is a skill in identifying and we discuss it in the book when a concept is should be shut down and I, in our business in computing business i would say we've we've made a hundred different programs in our computer business here and we've shut down 40 60 have worked 40 haven't and the skill for us i don't regret starting any of those 40 bad ones i wish we'd shut down a whole lot of them quicker than we did um so there's a, it's a dual edged sword isn't it you know elon, elon musk is is surviving and and i hope he does have some underlying risks so he doesn't throw everything in but um because that's ultimately that's resilience. Elon Musk would not be resilient if he ends up hungry and with no roof over his head. Um, so it's a complex issue. Yeah. Oh, it definitely is. And, and what you've said there also aligns with what a lot of uh, corporate innovation thought leaders, such as Clayton Christensen, um, author of The Innovator's Dilemma, suggests that organizations invest maybe 10, 15% of their R&D into your big, hairy, audacious goals but invest maybe 60 to 70% into their core business because that's after all where they make money today and you need to have that solid foundation from which to launch moonshots from. Well, you always need to have business continuity um, during a crisis. Couldn't agree more. We are coming towards the end of our conversation, Richard. It's been absolutely delightful. But before we wrap up, I'm going to throw you into our three-question rapid-fire lightning round. Question number one, Rich, is if you could work for any organization at any stage of the company lifecycle, and it's it may be in aviation, who would it be and during which time would it be? Google today in the um, mind area. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I, I can see why given our conversation today. Question number two, Rich. Uh, under Ray Kurzweil, I would work with Ray Kurzweil at Google Mind. Mm -hmm. So Ray Kurzweil, he coined the term the, the singularity. Correct. Yes. Fantastic. Um, and question number two is if you could ask anyone a question, dead or alive, who would it be and what would you ask? I don't know. I, I sort of... I sort of take responsibility for my own thoughts mm. and I, I, I probably asked the people who were horrible people, I, you know, I might have, I might have asked some of the most horrible people that have ever, ever been on the planet. What was your motivation? You know, when, when is enough enough? And, but I, it's a very good question because I, to be honest, I, I haven't thought of that. Okay, interesting. I, I tend to, um, a lot of people will say they'd like to ask a question of someone that they admired when they were young uh, or something to that degree. But Oh, no, I did that. In the QF32, I asked the governor, I was an aide to the governor generals of Government House. I said, you know, what was the path to your success? Mm -hmm. and, and they said it was, you know, I, they, they never thought they'd be governors, governor generals of Australia. They just said, I just tried to be the best I could be. And that was a really good lesson for me. So, um I, I can I can sort of understand how everyone's got to the successful position they can be. And that's why – and I sort of take control and, and responsibility for my own actions. And so I'm clear of my own mission. Um, but but I, I expect that Elon Musk would give the same answer that, that the Governor General has given, that all great people give, and all the great politicians have very clear why. So – um, I, when you when you analyze people who have not been successful, or you analyze anyone, if you look at their whys, that will tell you everything. Look at them. That's their motivation. Definitely, definitely. And lucky last, Richard, obviously, you know, you've, you've been a pilot now for over four decades. Um, you received, well, you were appointed a member of the Order of Australia for significant service to the aviation industry, both here and internationally. You've published a number of books now. Uh, you do a lot of speaking. You're obviously kicking goals on a number of fronts. And, and clearly, as today's uh, conversation will attest, you're um, very, very curious about a lot of of things and not just at a surface level, but also at a very deep level. I mean, what do you do on a daily basis to stay on top of your game? I'm reading. I'm reading. Yep. I'm reading. I'm doing things. I'm always occupied. There's a saying, if you want something done, ask a busy person. So Coral, my wife and I, we're, we're patrons of organizations. We, we're visiting lecturers at, a, at the anti-terrorism school in Australia. And um, I mean, I'm the a, a patron of a disabled organisation. So we, 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 we give time. It's time for me to give back. And it's important that I give back. 
and help people. Um, and but I read, mm. and, I, and, and I have about ten books that I have to read. But as I said, I read them once, I underline them, then I go back and I enter them to my knowledge management system. So reading for me takes two or three passes, and it's busy. So I pick my books carefully, and um, yeah, you cannot you cannot overinvest in your reading. Mm-hmm. No, that's, and that's that's a great point. It also echoes what a lot of uh, thought leaders and personalities we've had on the show previously uh, have said. So people can pick up a copy of Fly on Amazon and at all good bookstores. Um, they can also pick up your previous books on Amazon, such as QF32. Um, they can hit you up on Twitter at Richard Decrep. And you've also got a blog at qf 32 um, where And so there's a blog at uh, flythebook.com. And, and Steve, it's been – no one has asked me questions the way you have. And you've tapped, you, I probably frustrated you with my long answers, but you've tapped a vein of genuine passion in me mm-hmm. to both understand the human brain and to, and, and to work with high tech. So, you know, my, my vision when I retire is to go into robotics, or sentient robotics, and, um, you know, you, you tapped it. So I'm sorry it took so long, but I've really enjoyed talking no, to you. Likewise, likewise. And I think that's the beauty of um, these long form conversations via podcasts. And I think people are genuinely uh, curious and hungry for this type of thing rather than the short five, 10 minute thing you get on mainstream media. And uh, the recent Elon Musk interview on the Joe Rogan experience, I think, uh, has something like 10 million views already, which is more than any of the popular late night television programs and news programs in the US by a country mile. And I think it's just a, a reflection of people being starved for genuine conversations. Good point. I agree. Well, thank you so much again for your time and leaving our audience with a hell of a lot of value. Um, I'm probably going to go back and listen to this a couple of times and read the book a couple more times, but people should definitely head out, pick up a copy of Fly because it is more than just a book about how to survive a crisis situation in the air. It is a book about how to perform well, both in the professional and personal domain, not just perform well, but perform at the top of your game. So thank you again. Thanks, Steve. Cheers. Best wishes. Hi guys, Steve again. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you'd like to receive a weekly email from me, complete with reflections, books I've been reading, words of wisdom, and access to blogs, ebooks, and more that I'm publishing on a regular basis, just leave your details at futuresquared.xyz forward slash subscribe and you'll receive the very next one. If you're picking up what I'm putting down, take a minute to like, share, or subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. It goes a long way to giving the podcast the exposure it needs so I can continue bringing you guests and conversations of the highest caliber. You can catch me on Twitter at Steve Gubeski and on Instagram at The Steve Gubeski. Until next time, hasta la vista, baby.